Okay, so this is chapter 23, The Deity of Christ, uh, part two, we're underway. When I think about Jesus, I mean, this has got to be one of the huge questions of theology. There are just a few of them, and this is a big one. Who is this man? Uh, when he was on the, uh, the boat asleep, the disciples wake him up, and he stills the storm just with a word. I mean, a raging hurricane kind of thing there on the Sea of Galilee. And then he says, they, they respond with, who is this man that the wind and the waves obey him? Well, that's our question, is who is this man? And we're going to unpack that and try to get a picture on what the biblical teaching is and what the significance that is. Uh, and we find all kinds of false understandings of Jesus, but we want to get the right one. So let's unpack it a bit here. So we're going to start by talking about uh, Jesus is divine. Uh, he is Emmanuel, it says. The Lord is with us. God is with us. Fulfillment of prophecy. But let's unpack this a little bit. First, I want to think about how we approach the deity of Christ. Uh, and then I want to think about how we see that biblically, that Jesus really is God and come among us. So grab your Bibles. Uh, we're going to use it here for a bit. So go with me, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 1, okay? 1 Timothy chapter 1. Again, anytime you need to pause to, uh, to turn your Bible, you know, do that, because I really want you to look at materials. 1 Timothy chapter 1 is this great song that Paul's singing here. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Okay, so what are the characteristics of God here in 1 Timothy 1.17? What are the characteristics of God? Okay, he's immortal and he's invisible, honorable and glorious. Okay, now a little later in that same book, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Okay, so take a look at that. Talks about he will display at the proper time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, king of kings, lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see to be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Again, what are the characteristics of, that are essential to deity here? Uh, immortality, invisible, uh, those things. So let's, let's just think a little bit on what are some of those essential attributes of deity, okay? Uh, well, immortal, invisible, uh, immutable would be another one, omniscient, omnipresent. Uh, so there'll be a, a few of those. Now let's think of Jesus, okay? Because if, if God is uh, these things, and Jesus is God, then he should have those things. And you see where we're going here, maybe. So, immortal. What does that mean? Cannot be subject to death. Cannot have physical death. Is Jesus subject to physical death? Uh, how about John 19 <laughs> as an example? It's finished, said, bowed, up his, bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Is Jesus immortal? And the answer is no, he's not. Okay, how about uh, invisible? Uh, that we saw in First Timothy, First uh, John one, uh, very first verse of First John, that which in the beginning which we've heard, which are seen with our eyes, which looked on, which we've touched with our hands. The whole point is that we can see him and touch him in Jesus. Is Jesus invisible? And the answer is, mm -mm, he's not. Okay, getting a problem here. How about uh, immutable, unchangeable, constant? Uh, we look at the end of Luke chapter 2, the story of Jesus' birth and childhood, and we find there in Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and man. So here's a change. He is increasing in wisdom. He is getting bigger. He's getting greater favor with God and man. He's going from a baby to a man. Is he immutable? The answer is, mm, nope, he's not. Mm -mm. How about omniscient? Uh, does Jesus, God knows everything. Does Jesus know everything? And if you look at Luke 24, 36, okay, take a look at it. Luke 24, 36. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. And what he's saying here, the Son doesn't know the date of the second coming. So is Jesus omniscient? And the answer is, he's not. How about omnipresent? Uh, we believe that God is not limited by space or time. Is Jesus limited by space or time? 
Uh, you get the story in John 11. Jesus is over there, and he gets word that Lazarus is sick. Mary and Martha ask him to come, and he doesn't come. And after a bit, he says, okay, let's go now. And when they arrive, uh, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And the whole story depends on the reality that Jesus is not there at the time of Lazarus' death. Is he omnipresent? And the answer is, mm, no, he's not. So, immortal, invisible, immutable, omniscient, omnipresent, is, God, is Jesus any of those things? And the answer is, uh, he's not. So, what we have to do is think about how do we understand the deity of Jesus? How do we understand the deity of Jesus if he doesn't have those kinds of attributes? Now, we're going to unpack this over three lectures, so don't panic yet, because we won't come back to some of those details until the third lecture in this series. What I want to do is look at how the Bible presents the deity of Jesus. And so we're going to look at three basic lines of argumentation. Uh, the first kind of line of argumentation is what the Gospels say. Uh, the second line of argumentation is what the Epistles say. And the third line of argumentation is what, uh, where Jesus does things that only God can do. It's a little different order than Dr. Erickson puts it in, but uh, it makes more sense to me to do it this way. So when I look at John 1.1, 1, 1, for example... Uh, Okay, take a look at it. John 1.1. 1, 1. We got it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if I look at that, and we could unpack this at a lot greater length. We'll just do it briefly here. Uh, in the beginning, what beginning is that? Well, that's the Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, beginning when all things were created. Uh, so that beginning. So there's a time marker at the time when created things were created, uh, the word, the logos, was. So at that time marker, in the beginning, the word was already existing. That's what the idea of was means. So at the time of the beginning, the word was already, and was is a way of saying continuing existence. Now this is pretty amazing. What this is saying is when all created things were created, the word was already in continuing existence. So the word predates all created things. Hmm. Uh, second phrase, the word was with God. So it's at that time, same time frame, at, at the time when all created things were beginning, the word was continuing existence in a way that was with God. Now there are different with words in, in Greek. One of them is a side-by-side -side type with, and one of them is a face-to-face -face relational type with. Well, this is the face-to-face -face relational type picture. So this is saying the word is in a face-to-face -face personal relationship with God before created things were created. You know, this is getting pretty amazing because uh, this is a big step up. And then the final thing, and the word was God is the way it's translated. Now, there's something that you can't see in English, but let me point it out. In the second phrase, the word was with the God. That article is in the Greek. It's not in the English, of course, because it makes no sense. We don't say it that way. The word was a the God, but it's a particular God. The, the final phrase, and the word was God, there's no article there. So unpack this a bit. It's same time frame in the beginning when all created things were created. The word before that was God. Now, there are two ways to understand this. Uh, one way is to say, well, that means that he is one God among many. He is a God. Another way is to say that he has the characteristics of Godness. Uh, for example, if, if uh, uh, oh, Julie goes out on a date with Bill and comes back and uh, her, her girlfriend says, well, how was it? And she says, oh, Bill's a dog. What are you saying at that point? Is she saying that Bill is one dog among many uh, waggy, barky kind of things? No, she's saying Bill has the characteristics of dogness, and that doesn't actually bear out real well. And that's the idea we have here. We have the same thing in John 4, 24, where it says 
that God is spirit. It's exactly the same idea, and the idea is he has the characteristics of spiritness. So what it's saying here, especially in light of the next phrase where it says the word participates in creation, is he is not a God among many, which of course no Jew would say, but what it's saying here is that he has the characteristics of the God. So that's an amazing statement, very, very, very strong statement of deity here in uh, John 1.1. 1, 1. So we have his eternal existence in the first line, his eternal relationship with God, and his eternal deity in John 1. It's pretty strong stuff, pretty strong stuff. Uh, but that's not the end of it. Keep going. John 1.18, down just a little bit on the page. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. So here it's calling. Uh, it's this one is called the only God. The, the Logos lives in intimate family relationship with God. It's, it's, it's a very strong statement. In John 17, 21, in this high priestly prayer, Jesus, as he's praying for the disciples and praying for us as those who will learn from the disciples, has an amazing statement. He says, you, Father, are in me, and I in you. So there's a mutual indwelling here. We call it perichoresis in technical terms. And this intimate family relationship is one of equality. The Father is in Jesus, and Jesus is in the Father. I mean, that's a very strong statement of deity. Uh, how about John chapter 8? Go back just a bit. John chapter 8, Jesus is in a, a tussle with the Pharisees, and they're in this big blustery battle, and they're talking about that they're children of Abraham, and Jesus responds, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now, what's he saying here? Abraham saw my day. Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus. The Jews could respect to him and said, you're not yet 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? Very reasonable question, because some guy who lived 2,000 years ago seeing somebody who's just a kid, like, what's the deal? And Jesus responds with this very powerful statement, John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Ego a me. And you say, wait a minute, before Abraham was, I am? Like, that's unbelievable. Uh, like, what is the deal here? And the people respond, the Jews respond with this thing when he said, before Abraham was, I am, which is claiming the divine name from Exodus 3.14 for himself, before Abraham was, I am, he identifies himself as I am. The, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Jews, <laughs> well, they respond, as you might expect, they pick up stones to throw at him. How come? Because he has claimed to be God. So they start singing, we will, we will rock you. You know, it's a, they respond properly because he is, he's either guilty of blasphemy unless it's true. And of course we would say it's true. Another place, John chapter 20. Eight days later, his disciples were inside. Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Jesus came among them and said, Peace be with you. Shalom alechem. Remember, Thomas wanted to say, Unless I stick my fingers in his hand, my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus shows up and he says, Hey, Thomas, finger, <laughs> side. Don't believe, believe. And so what we have here is this picture when Thomas responds to that call with that incredible statement, my Lord and my God. So he's giving, a, he's responding to Jesus showing up there with that strong statement, my Lord and my God. Uh, some Jehovah's Witnesses would say that's just a statement of surprise. Oh my God, look who's here. But no, that's, that's not what it is. He is calling Jesus God. Why? Because he's recognizing that fulfilled prophecy. Uh, one more from uh, from Gospels. Go to Book of Mark. We've been looking at John, and many people dismiss John as later and and uh, not historically accurate. So let's go to Mark, which every which many would agree is the earliest of the Gospels and would have the highest rating among critical scholars for authenticity and accuracy. Mark chapter one. 
Uh, it begins as is written Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the one crying in the wilderness. Know what he's crying. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, in the book of Mark, who is the Lord whose way is being prepared? And the answer is, well, it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the Lord is Jesus, but that's a quotation. So go back to Isaiah chapter 40, where this quotation comes from. It also comes from another book, but the heart of it is Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verse 3, In the wilderness prepare a way for the Lord, for caps, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So in Isaiah 40, who is the Lord? And there the Lord is Yahweh. So what Mark is saying is Jesus is Yahweh, come among us. They have to know the Old Testament to make this connection, but it's not that hard. What Mark is saying in the second verse of his gospel is Jesus is Yahweh come among us. Powerful stuff. A few verses later in verse 8, he's, John says, I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Who is the baptizer here? Well, it's Jesus. But you go back to where that's quoted from, Joel chapter 2, verse 27, you know, I am in the midst of Israel, that I, the Lord, and God, there is none else, and it will come afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Who's the I doing the spirit work there? The baptizer is Yahweh. So again, Mark is saying, Jesus is Yahweh come among us. Now there's more stuff in the Gospels, but what you see is the Gospels solidly present a picture that Jesus is divine. The problem is, if you're dealing with somebody who's not in, has questions about the nature of the Bible, they're going to dismiss the Gospels as later editions of the church, later editions of the church, and not historically reliable. Now, I think they are true. I think they are historically reliable, but, but others are going to downplay that, especially if you've been watching Bart Ehrman or someone like that. So let's go to a place where we don't have that kind of problem. Let's go to the epistles and see what it says there. Look at the book of Romans. Okay, Romans chapter 9. Uh, there's nobody who denies that Romans was written by Paul and it was written oh, 60 AD or a little bit after. Nobody debates that. It's a generation after Jesus. So here we have a book that is authentically Pauline and unmistakably ancient. And it's the kind of doctrinal summary of the early church. Nobody debates that. And if you look at Romans chapter 9, verse 5, it's talking about the Jews there. And he says, from their race, that is Israel, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Now, that is such a straightforward statement that Christ is God over all. I mean, there it is. Uh, this, there are some who would say, well, that's not what it means. He, who is, uh, he, uses, uh, he uses just blessing, blessed be God for bringing this Messiah, but it's just a very forced translation, and no translation goes that way. So here's a statement in just so many terms that Christ is God over all. Uh, it, it's, it's something that, uh, this early, what it does is show that the early church definitely believed that Christ is God, without any doubt. Uh, there's another one in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, Titus 2, 13, where Paul is saying, We're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's identifying Jesus as God and Savior here in Titus 2, 13. Uh, Colossians 2, 9, uh, in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. So what the thing is here, and certain men or women would have certain characteristics, and they'd say, well, he has the valor of Mars or something like that. And what Paul is saying is in Jesus, all the characteristics of D are there. It's not just a single attribute. So there's a full set of divine, and in Christ's human body, uh, the essence of D finds a settled home. Uh, one or two more, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. He's quoting the Old Testament here, Psalm 45. He says, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So the writer of Hebrews here, the preacher, is saying 
that when that psalm, your throne, O God, is about the Messiah, Son, and it's the Son is addressed as God. I mean, it's pretty strong. Uh, there are a lot of other statements we could point to, uh, and there are others in Dr. Erickson's book. You can take a look at that. But the, the epistles repeatedly and in different places point out that they believe Jesus is divine. So gospel statements, epistle statements, and then the third is the Jesus does divine things. So let's look at this again. Isaiah 44, Isaiah 44, verse 24. Again, push pause and go there. I want you to look at it. Isaiah 44, 24. I am the Lord, Yahweh, who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out earth by myself. So what it's saying here is Yahweh alone creates. Okay? Now look at Colossians 1.16. For by him, that's the Son, all things were created in heaven and earth. All things were created through him and for him. So what this is saying is Jesus creates. So here it is. Isaiah 44 says Yahweh alone creates. Colossians 1 said Jesus creates. So what does that imply? Without any question, it says that Jesus is Yahweh because he does things that Yahweh alone does. It's, it's a very strong statement. Um, Matthew 4.10, Jesus says, You shall worship the Lord your God in him only, of course, quoting Deuteronomy, so Yahweh alone is to be worshipped, Jesus says. But in John chapter 9, the man born blind, uh, he says, Lord, I believe, and worshipped him. So Jesus is worshipped, and he accepts it. So the conclusion very strongly is that Jesus has accepted worship. Look at the angel in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 9. The angel said to me, Write this, bless those who invited the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. So John is about to worship an angel. And he said, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who told you to testimony. Worship God. Worship him only. Even powerful angels refuse worship. So Matthew 4, Jesus said, Yahweh alone is to be worshipped. But in John 9, he is worshipped and accepts it. And therefore, Jesus is Yahweh. And he, he does things only God can do. A couple more. Uh, Isaiah 43. I, I am he who blots out transgressions for your sake. I will not remember sin. So Yahweh alone forgives sins. What happens in Mark chapter 2? Mark chapter 2, the paralytic, the guys tear a hole in the roof, lower him down. Jesus saw their faith. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Some of the scribes said, wait a minute, this guy's blaspheming. No one can forgive sins but God only. So we see here that Jesus says that he forgives sins, something that only God can do. And then to prove that he had the authority to do that, is it easier to take your sins are forgiven or rise up, take your bed and walk? He says, know that you know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, rise up, take up your bed and walk. So Mark chapter 2, Yahweh alone forgives sins, but Jesus forgives sins, therefore Jesus is Yahweh. Again, he does things that only God can do, uh, forgiving third-party sins. There are many others. Uh, the Confession, Romans 10, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, is a quotation from Joel 2, where the Lord is Yahweh. And again, we see that connection between them. Uh, is this idea of divine Messiah new? And the answer is it's not. I want to show you a couple of passages. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Take a look at it. Psalm 110. This is Psalm of David. And it says here, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And the question here, Who is my Lord? Yahweh says to Adonai. The Lord says to my Lord. Who is the my Lord for David? So this is somebody above David. He is king of Israel. Who is above him? Well, there's no humans above him. So it's somebody heavenly. And who is he going to say my Lord to? Well, it's not Michael. I mean, that doesn't work. So the question is, who is the my Lord? 
And the answer here is the only one he'd say my Lord to in a worshipful way has to be Yahweh, but it's not Yahweh. So there's a my Lord that's Yahweh, but he's not. I mean, it's, it, it, well, of course, we know it's a Trinitarian type thing. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Look at Daniel 7. Another picture here, Daniel 7 verse 9. We see the Ancient of Days, this divine figure in the midst of all these crazy nightmarish beasts. Verse 13 then, I saw in the night visions, behold, the clouds of heaven, there's one like a son of man. So here's one like a human. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Uh, where, does the son of, where does this one like the son of man come from? It's not he's coming up from earth to be presented at the Ancient of Days. He's coming clouds of heaven. And in Old Testament, clouds are a way of saying from God. Hmm. So he has a heavenly origin. So who is in heaven? Well, God is. Uh, angels are. Uh, demons are up in the heavenlies. And dead humans apparently are. So which one of those is he? And you look at the next verse, verse 14, and to him is given dominion, glory, kingdom, that all peoples and languages should, should what? Should worship him? Huh. There's some of your translation will have serve him, but it's a worshipful serving. So how's this? He's like a human, but he's heavenly origin, and he's going to be worshipped, and that's a way of saying the Son of Man is a divine figure. So here we have this picture of a divine my Lord in Psalm 110 and a divine Messiah in Daniel chapter 2. Now look at Mark 14. You get this picture in other Gospels as well. Mark 14, again the high priest asks him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Just straight up, tell me. And Jesus says this, I am, <laughs> there's the divine name kind of, and then he does two things. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Well, that's Psalm 110. That's Psalm 110. He has claimed one Psalm 110 for himself. And the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he just claimed Daniel 7, divine Messiah there for himself. And what he's done there twice is take divine Messiah prophecies and apply them to himself. And the high priest tears his garments. You heard his blasphemy. He's claiming to be God. The high priests understand it. So the question is, when you hear these kinds of things, will you believe that? Will you believe that Jesus is, in fact, the divine one, the promised Messiah? It's... It's a powerful statement. It's a hard-to-believe statement because this would be unique in all of history, very different than Zeus coming down to play war games with the guys, get a little blood money and a little time with the girls and get a, some good beer or something. Very different perspective than, uh, than any one of the gods coming down to experience life on earth and to participate in a battle. He's coming down in a whole different way. This is God come among us for redemption. So what does that mean? key point there we saw in John 1, 18 is he will reveal the Father. He really will reveal the Father. So you can say in John 14, before Thomas, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. What does that mean? He is the one who is fully equal with the Father. In his eternality, he is God. Uh, it speaks to the reuniting of God and humanity that was broken back in the garden. Uh, and it speaks ahead to the atonement that he's going to be doing as God-man. It's so powerful and so essential. This is one of those things I call a die for. This is so important that if somebody put a gun to my head and said recant or die, I'd have to say pull the, pull the trigger. And I can't, it's just that fundamental to our faith that Jesus is Emmanuel, come with God come among us.